Uh, today is Monday, July 26th, 2021. It is 7.36 p.m. Uh, good evening. My name is Christian Klein. I'm the chair of the Arlington Zoning Board of Appeals. I'm calling this meeting of the board to order. I'd like to confirm that members and anticipated officials are present uh, from the Board of Appeals. Uh, Roger DuPont. Here. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Hanlon? Here. Kevin Mills will hopefully be calling in in a moment. I'll check on him again. Aaron Ford? Here. And uh, Stephen Revelack? Here. Good evening, all. Um, on behalf of the town, um, I don't think Rick Valerelli is with us this evening, but uh, I saw Vincent Lee is here with us. Um, Kelly Linema is here. I saw Emily Sullivan is here. And uh, Jennifer Reed is here, the Director of Planning and Community Development. So welcome all. And thank you for taking part this evening. Um, consultants to the board, uh, Paul Haverty is here, our 4B consultant. Paul, good to see you. Good evening, Mr. Chairman. Good evening. Uh, from Beta Group, um, Marty Nover is here. Marty, good to see you. I see Laura's Hi, here, Bill as well. Excellent. Bill McGrath, Mr. Chair. Thank you for joining us. Um, on behalf of 1165R Mass Ave, uh, Mary Wynn Stanley O'Connor is here. Mary, good to see you. Thank you, same here. And then um, I was sort of checking off names as I saw them come in. I see that uh, Randy Mirren is here. I see Daniel St. Clair is here. Uh, Joy Myrak is here. Are there others I've missed? Yes, Bob Myrak is on the call. Joel Bargman, the architect. Uh, Jared Leonard um, from the team and uh, Hugo Arlo. Perfect, thank you. Okay. This open meeting of the Arlington Zoning Board of Appeals is being conducted remotely consistent with an act extending certain COVID-19 measures adopted during the state of emergency signed into law on June 16th, 2021. This act includes an extension until April 1st, 2022 of the remote meeting provisions of Governor Baker's March 12th, 2020 executive order suspending certain provisions of the open meeting law, which suspended the requirement to hold all meetings in a publicly accessible physical location. Further, all members of public bodies are allowed to continue to participate remotely. Public bodies may, re may meet remotely so long as reasonable public access is afforded so the public can follow along with the deliberations of the meeting. An opportunity for public participation will be provided during the public comment period during each public hearing. For this meeting, the Arlington Zoning Board of Appeals has convened a video conference via the Zoom app with online and telephone access as listed on the agenda posted to the town's website, identifying how the public may join. This meeting is being recorded and it is being broadcast by ACMI. Please be aware that attendees are participating by a variety of means. Some attendees are participating by video conference. Others are participating by computer audio or telephone. Accordingly, please be aware that other folks may be able to see you, your screen name, or another identifier. Please take care to not share personal information. Anything you broadcast may be captured by the recording. We ask you to please maintain decorum during the meeting, including displaying an appropriate background. All supporting materials that have been provided members of this body are available on the town's website, unless otherwise noted. The public is encouraged to follow along using the posted agenda. Else is in the waiting room. Don't see them. Kevin Mills here yet. Ben, do you mind texting Kevin and seeing if he's doing okay? Uh, will do. Perfect. Thanks. So the first item up on our agenda this evening is 1165R Massachusetts Avenue. So now turning to the comprehensive permit hearing for 1165R Massachusetts Avenue, here's some ground rules for effective and clear conduct of tonight's business. Last week, the board discussed the draft decision prepared by our Chapter 40B con technical consultant, Paul Haverty. There was detailed discussion regarding many of the findings and conditions between the board, its consultants, the town, and the applicant. We also had some very poignant input from several of the abutters. 
as many of these comments have been incorporated into the revised draft review this evening. I appreciate that this will be the first time that many of you have, are going to be seeing this revision. I'll begin the evening by reviewing the track changes in the revised draft with the applicant, the consultants in the town, and then we will open the hearing for questions and public comment. So let me go ahead and share the draft. A little bigger. <clears throat> okay. Um, so I'll just quickly go through a few of these. I do want to, the, um, the waivers have now been added to the end. I do want to sort of skip ahead to that, but I'm just going to quickly go through some of this. Um, the procedural history, the original application was for 130 and it was re reduced to 124. So that's captured now in the, in the history. Um, so there's currently, it appears there's six structures. This is just about the current property, folks involved. Um, so we're referring to it now as a two acre parcel of land. Mary, does that Yes, once it's subdivided, um, it will be a two, the project site will be a two acre parcel. Okay. Um, but, the, but I put on it, but I think it's correct to say um, the project is located in our previously developed two point um, I, I think that reference is likely correct. Okay, so we could say it's previously developed 2.3. Yes. But now it's going to be, but after. It's going to be two acre. Future subdivision will be 2.0. Yes. Okay. Perfect. Thank you for that. Um, transportation. Um, so we are confirmed now we are 128 parking spaces. Um, I, 110 garage parking spaces, that's between two buildings and then 18 surface spaces. Correct. And we have the 114 bicycle parking spaces and Mary, you had confirmed that that is 50% of them are low and 50% are high. So they're just, they're just stacked throughout. That's great. Okay. There is a possibility, Mr. Chia, that we may be able to add 10 more, okay. five and five. Uh, moving into the conditions. Um, so again, confirming the number of parking spaces. Uh, we had spoken that the Conservation Commission fee would be reduced from 15,000 to 12,000. So that Correct. was included here. Um, so there are some uh, dates which um, a seven. I will. I want to come back to, but we'll pass it over for the moment. Um, so in B four, so this is one the board's going to have to talk a little bit more about. Um, so this is the local preference. So the under by law, the board may require the applicant to provide up to seventy percent of the affordable. Um, the affordable units to people who meet certain local conditions, but the board has the ability to uh, set that number wherever um, it deems appropriate for the development and it also has the ability to strike that number. So um, the prior version had said 70% and I know there's been discussion of a couple different numbers, but this is one of the things that the board will need to um, discuss and come up with what it feels is the appropriate, um, the appropriate allocation for this site. And my client has no particular preference one way or the other, whatever the board's preference is. Perfect. Thank you. So, Mr. Chairman, just, just to yeah. address that, I did put in some suggested language um, with regards to having that as no local preference. Mm -hmm. Obviously, it's the board's choice whether to adopt it or not. Okay. And I know I know the, the board has, has talked about a couple different positions on this and I think it's one of those things that we need to discuss further to figure out where exactly we stand. Um, so here, this is about technical reviews um, that occur as a part of the permit process, um, not as a part of, of the comprehensive permit process, but this is after that. Mm -hmm. um, 
when the the building permit and such is being um, being sought, and the town can request supplemental funds under 53G. Uh, there was a request from the applicant that 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 the value of those be capped, um, and we have uh, some uh, some guidance from the town um, that we should avoid a cap. Um, and so this is something again that the board needs to come back to um, and discuss a little more fully as to how they the board wishes to proceed on this item. And 30 versus 45. Uh, <clears throat> so this is just a clarification that the, um, the utilities that are serving the new development are going to be run underground from a pole on Ryder Street. And the, this does not reference the pole that is, has been the subject of discussion that is on the, the right of way up to Massachusetts Avenue. That's a, I'm not a, so um, certain that all those are gonna be underground. Randy, could you uh, comment? I believe, uh, hang on Mary, I'm just reading it. I, I believe they are going to be underground electric telephone. The electric too on Ryder Street? So the plans indicate that they're all below grade. Yeah, I, okay. I think we're saying they do. Right, they do. Yeah. Okay. And at some point, you connect to overhead wires, and what we just wanted to be clear was we'll put them underground as we have shown on the plans. Yeah. Um, right. There's a pole right at the exit onto Ryder Street. Right. So my understanding is from that pole over. Right, and the utility company might end up doing something different at that point. It's up to them, but uh, mm -hmm. that's the plan. And that's what they've directed us to do. Okay. <clears throat> Straight forward. Um, there was a, some discussion last time about uh, earth removal, and this is um, requiring just to describe uh, to the, how much is going to need to be cut and filled. Um, that's fairly straightforward. Um, Rider Street, this was a recommendation um, I had made. We had set specific hours when the construction deliveries are not to be made on Rider Street uh, due to the, the, the schools. We just wanted to include a provision that the senior transportation planner in consultation with the construction manager could adjust those hours in the interest of public safety, just in case we need to move it one way or another. Well, should, should it be tied into the um, school hours related to, the, because that could be read to be anything, I suppose. Um, yeah, this is what, E25? Yeah. Take a look at that. Um, so traffic safety sidewalks, trying to sort of clarify a little bit. Um, so the site will be signed directing motor vehicles to enter via the Mass Ave right of way or Quinn Road and exit via Ryder Street mm -hmm. or Quinn Road. Or Quinn Road. Um, Massachusetts Avenue driveways will allow two-way travel for two existing travel. abutting uses. Bicycle users will be allowed to enter and exit the site from Ryder Street, the driveway to Massachusetts Avenue, and the roadway to Quinn Road. So just clarifying which ones are for motor vehicles and which ones are for uh, bicycles. Um, just clarifying about the combination of parking spaces. Um, <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, so this section deals with parking restrictions. Um, and they request to provide a telephone number and online portal for residents to report potential infractions to the property manager. Just having some way to 
report complaints that either other members of the who live in the facility or um, people who live on adjacent properties have a, a way to contact the building property manager. Uh, F6 is just a clarification that parking on private ways is prohibited and parking on public ways is governed by the bylaws of the town of Arlington. Straightforward. Uh, F12, uh, property managers shall review the request for parking quarterly and adjust policies as required to minimize impacts on adjacent neighborhood. That's just, I know that the property manager is gonna be allocating spaces between what are required by residents, what's required for guest parking, and it's just that they should look at that at a periodic interval and make sure that they're allocating things appropriately. Uh, G6, uh, we had talked about fire access, and we wanted to change the language. The project shall maintain fire access sufficient to comply with applicable state building code and or fire code requirements to all four sides of each residential structure at all times. Forward. Uh, so during construction, the project and the clarification of the language. Um, so this one, I think it's gonna be a little controversial. <laughs> um, so <clears throat> there's, this is something that the board needs to consider. There's been a lot of concern about that poll. Um, and I, I know, uh, Mary, you had provided a letter this afternoon, uh, sort of clarifying how we've gotten to the, the place we are now and the difficulties involved in moving that poll. Um, and we just, we need to, I think, discuss a little further tonight. And then the board has to really figure out, um, you know, what the, what this poll really means to the, to the safety of the abutters and to the safety of the users. And how do we, how do we address this? Um, but this is just a provisional language that if we can, until the such time as we can get enough space between the pole and the opposite curve that two cars can pass, we really shouldn't be using that as a two-way street. Well, the project isn't using it as a two-way street. But I believe it allows for there, because the adjacent the existing of, um, the existing, existing abutting user is allowed to use that. Right. In two directions. right. There's nothing we can do about that. Mm -hmm. This is the environmental monitor question. And this is one I think we'll have, we may have to go back and um, I know Emily Sullivan's on the call. I can't recall if this is the most current language or not. Hi, Christian. Yeah, I, I, Mary, I, I know we discussed a, the, um, the frequency of reporting. Uh, this says uh, weekly. Is that, I know that the conversation we had last week was just, we didn't. Uh, we had it was monthly, it. Emily. Monthly? Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. okay. So I4 will change the period to monthly. Actually, Christian. I think that um, Emily and I sent you the agreed to language between the commission and the applicant as to that paragraph. Oh, okay. So Christian, I can email this uh, to you again then if that's uh, easiest. Yeah, if you could forward that to myself and to Paul. Paul as well. Perfect, will do. Thank you. There were several others too, so you may want mm -hmm. to check it against. Okay. Mr. Chairman? Yes, please. Uh, this is Pat. Uh, yeah. um, I just want to make sure that we've turned the square, square corners here, but if as is anticipated, uh, we end up closing the public hearing tonight, um, are we, is it still fine? I and mean, maybe this is a question for Mr. Haverty. Is it still fine to be getting additional language and the various things that Emily and Mary have just referred to? If it's something that's already been <clears throat> submitted by Emily and it's already in the record, it's, you know, her, her having her send it again to bring it to my attention wouldn't be a problem. 
But if it's if it's not already in the record, that's a, then it would be a problem. Then that would be something of a problem, yes. But my understanding is that it's already been sent. I, I think Emily actually forwarded it to me after the last hearing already. Okay. Is, I believe, is this the June sixth letter? Uh, July twentieth. July twenty. Okay. The July 20th is when the email was forwarded, correct? Yeah, well, my letter to Susan and Emily is dated July 20th, and Emily's email um, is dated July 21st. Okay. Confirming here. Yes, yeah, so that was sent. Yeah, on the twentieth. So, Paul, you should have that. <clears throat> yep, I have it. Perfect. Okay. <clears throat> Um, erosion control should be installed, upgrading the banks of, I think we need to keep the, keep that language, but. Yeah, it wasn't clear on that. If we take out of the re relocated right of Brook, I don't really know what banks we're talking about. Right. And that may very well be covered in the in the reference letter. I'll yeah, that might be. That. no, that one's not covered in the letter. Oh, it's not. Okay. But I'll defer to Emily on that. Okay. Yeah, I don't recognize that uh, revision. Okay. But this is reference is but we're in agreement this is referencing the writer brook correct okay. referencing yes before talks about the no parking of unregistered vehicles on the site uh, perhaps the service of vehicles on site, overnight parking of vehicles on public ways is prohibited in the town of Arlington, parking of vehicles on private ways is prohibited. Just add that clarifying note. Ken, we do have site parking on our site. Correct, but that don't know if those are technically private ways or if those are Site drive, site drive. The site driveway. So that's the, okay. My bad. Those aren't private ways. My fault. Nope, that's okay. I'll go back to my cave. <laughs> um, okay, so the waivers. Uh, the board grants policy. So this is the proposed grant waivers. Um, so our bylaws, Article 5, Section 563, prohibits multifamily uses in industrial zoning district. The applicant seeks a waiver. To allow 124 multifamily zoning in the industrial zoning district. Um, so I know we have a, a memorandum from the Department of Planning and Community Development that came in today that was requesting some clarification on, I believe, the statement of the um, of the waiver requests. Um, so uh, Kelly Linema, I don't know if you want to address that or if uh, Jennifer Wright, the director, wants to address those. Um, actually, uh, Jenny, would you prefer to respond? I can also answer. Kelly, I think you can walk through the um, okay. the memo, please. Sure. Do, um, so, do you want me to bring that memo up? Uh, go ahead. All right, give me a second.
There we go. Okay, so um, regarding the first, I think it was in the first four waiver requests, um, the department recommends that the applicant either take one of two actions. So the applicant would either request a waiver for the use, so allowing thereby allowing them to construct a multifamily development in an industrial zone, and then request a waiver from um, the zoning bylaw section 3.4, which is environmental design review. And then thereby, therefore, they would not need to request waivers from the industrial zoning district dimensional requirements. The second course of action or the alternative would be to request a waiver for the use, thereby then also allowing the multifamily use in an industrial district, and then requesting waivers for the industrial zoning district dimensional requirements. So requesting a waiver from section 5.6.2a. Um, we don't feel that both approaches are required um, and they actually somewhat confuse um, whether this is a development of the, the precise reasons for requesting the waivers. Um, so I think you could, you could take one approach or the other. So my sense if I could, is that B would be the preferred approach. Paul, I, I would think B would be more appropriate. What's your sense? I agree. I, the, the waivers that should be requested are the, the requirements that are applicable to the particular zoning district. <clears throat> if I if I might, Christian. Yes, please, Ms. Wright. Um, I we don't allow residential in the industrial zoning district. So there are no requirements for residential in the district. So that is the reasoning behind Kelly's evaluation of one versus the other option. Um, if I may also, one other thing that we noted is the use of the phrasing article, article five, mm -hmm. which is not, um, does not relate back to our zoning bylaw. So we've asked that that be amended to say bylaw. Okay. So it should read zoning bylaw section 563. Correct. Okay. So in the memo here, we had simply um, repeated that for any instance of a waiver request in which that would apply, um, which that language would apply or for which the option of either Avenue A or Avenue B would apply. Okay. So if we are going the route with B um, and we are requesting a waiver for the use and it, and as Ms. Rate noted that the, there are no dimensional requirements because it's not a permitted use, is this waiver still necessary for 562 that's a, a waiver to, for minimum yard setbacks and the like there would still be a need for a waiver even though it's the, the residential use is not allowed there are mm -hmm. requirements in that zoning district for structures and there are height requirements okay that are contained in section 5.6.2 okay necessary okay so the so then just reviewing those two, so the first one, which is 563, we would be changing the app, we'll have the applicant change this so that it is uh, requesting a waiver from the, the restriction on the use. And then section 562 will remain and it. This will be uh, requesting a waiver from the requirements of the, the setbacks and the building height. There were, um, so, Chair, would you like me to please respond to some of the other ones? Okay. Um, so I think these top two here, the, the top three here are just in the similar vein as what I mentioned before. 
um, just removing the word article um, and referring to the zoning bylaw in which section, but not the article. And if you could go down to the next page. Um, similar here. I think page three is where, okay. Um, under the waiver requesting the reduction in um, bike parking spaces, um, we, re we recommend that the applicant provide as many bicycle parking spaces as possible, um, ideally equivalent to a number of the dwelling units or equal to the number of automobile parking, automobile parking spaces. Um, especially given the request for a reduction in, in automobile parking spaces and the proximity of the development to the Minuteman bikeway. Um, our transportation, senior transportation planner had noted that two tier or stacked bike parking um, actually can meet the requirements of the bike parking bi guidelines if it is constructed through a system like one link to at the, at the DRO link below. Um, and that would just provide sort of a hydraulic assist to allow people to get their bike up to that second tier of parking. If I could have Mr. Bargman speak to that. He's the- Hi, architect. this is Joel Bargman, the architect for the project. Um, I, get, I think you've given us a choice on the number of spaces and if we can accommodate 124, which would be of these type units, which would be one per dwelling unit, and the only thing I would request is in, in the language, could we say <clears throat> stacked parking constructed by a system that provides assistance to the user to get the bike up and down without specifically referring to a, a brand or a type? Yes, yeah. Um, and if, other than that, it's a nice idea and, and we can accommodate that. And if, if I remember correctly in the, the, so the request here is very specifically is for is a waiver in the number of spaces and not in the other requirements for um, bicycle parking that are included in the zoning bylaw. Well, well I, I yeah. had read the we had read the bylaws. The design didn't permit stacked uh, parking, bicycle parking. So that's why we. <clears throat> I see. Mr. Chairman? Yes, please, Mr. Hanlon. Um, so if I understand this right, in, in essence, what the waiver is still for the number and the discussion that we just had about how many spaces will be for, because, well, because the you'll still need a waiver even at 124, 128 spaces. So you still need that. And then I, I gather there would be up in the conditions part a separate condition that requires the uh, uh, the provision of 128 and and allows for the stacking. Is that the way it would work? Because it it seems odd to have a, a an affirmative obligation occur in the waiver part in the waiver section. Mr. Chairman, if I could respond, that, that's exactly what I would do. Is I would go back into the body of the decision and revise the conditions to include the number of bicycle parking spaces and to include the requirements for the hydraulic lifting of the bicycles to the second tier. Sorry, I, I lost the first part of that. <clears throat> I said that I, I would absolutely do um, what, what board member Hanlon suggested, which is to go back into the body of the decision and revise the conditions to change the number, total number of parking spaces and to include the requirements that the upper level be assisted with some sort of hydraulic lifting system. Perfect. We can certainly do that. I might just, I might just add that the hydraulics is specific to certain brands. There are assists that don't use hydraulics. So if it just said assist, I think that would be more accurate and give us more flexibility and not have to buy just one particular brand, which is what we're trying to avoid. Yeah, perhaps, Mr. Chair, Steve Revelock, uh, perhaps Revelock. mechanical assist would be sufficient language? Sure, uh, that's, that's more generic and more helpful. Thank you, good suggestion. 
I didn't hear what what was that suggestion? Mr. Evelyn? Mechanical assist. Yeah. Mechanical, perfect, thank you. And then Chairman Klein, the remainder of the comments are really that um, one specific like minor administrative change to remove the word article. Okay. And to add zoning before bylaw. Yes. Very good. So, uh, so Mr. Haverty, did you see anything in those changes that are things we cannot do sort of administratively at this yeah. point? Is there anything that we need resubmittal on? Oops, you're on mute. <clears throat> oh, you're still on mute. Oh, still on mute. There you go. I clicked it too this time. <laughs> I'm switching back and forth between the screen and the uh, the document. Um, I, I do have some comments. Um, if you go, if you want to go back to the decision with yep. regards to the waivers, um, questions. Mm -hmm. So for instance, on the waiver Arlington design standards, uh, I'm not really sure the nature of what is required and what is being requested for that waiver. Arlington has some design uh, standards that they like to see utilized. Um, so we did not know if the board was going to impose them. Is there a substantive requirement or is this like a special permit process? No, there's no, uh, Jenny. May, uh, Mr. Chair. Please. Um, so that is that is not a that is in a, not in our zoning bylaw. I would not suggest including that as a waiver request. So where does that requirement come from? Well, it is a it is a it's a standard, um, and they are adopted by the Arlington Redevelopment Board and utilized mm -hmm. during during the special permit environmental design review process. Okay, so that's a special, that's part of a special permit process, which is subsumed under a full- Under, yeah. exactly. Okay, so, so okay. yeah, waiver is not necessary then? Not to specially call them out, no. Okay, perfect, thank you. Thank you. Thank you both. And then, so the, the requirement on the, the request for the waiver of local fees, I think we, touched on this last time, but I just wanted to point out that that's a decision the board really needs to make, whether or not to grant waivers beyond the inflow and infiltration fees. And then the last thing I had, um, wetlands bylaw title five, article eight, sections 10 and 11, having to do with the bond requirements. Uh, the conservation commission had recommended against approving this waiver so just needed the board to make a decision on that as well. Okay. And then other than that, they appear to be all set. So of any of the things we've discussed this evening, is there anything that requires additional information that the board does not already have? I do not believe so. Is there anyone, uh, question on the board, is there anyone on the board who feels we need additional information on anything that we've touched on this evening? Steve Revelock, Mr. Chair. Mr. Revelock. Uh, with respect to the bonding requirements that Mr. Haverty just referred to, uh, do we have any idea of the amount that might be expected for this project? Um, no, Ms. Sullivan can try to respond to that. If not, Ms. Rate. I so Christian, I don't have a sense of the amount of the bond, um, other than that the commission didn't believe that the bond should be waived. So, 
I, I can certainly get that information or, or get a sense based on other projects the commission has permitted in the past. I mean, even a even just a an order of magnitude figure would be I I I just like so to know whether we're talking ten thousand dollars or a hundred thousand or a million or you know somewhere in between basically. Mr. Chair. Oh, sorry. No, go, Jenny. Sorry. Uh, I was just—I was simply going to state that I am—I'm not aware of the the typical amount. Um, so I, I would think that you know Emily could look at some prior projects and and help to provide some sort of range. I wonder if that's the kind of thing that would be a percentage as opposed to necessarily a fixed value. I think the Conservation Commission does a fixed value. Does, oh, okay. Mr. Chairman, yes, please. Um, this is Pat. Yeah. Uh, again, I'm 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 trying to be as I'm sure the chairman is also uh, sensitive to the fact that that the hearing may close uh, in another hour and a half or so, and so I'm wondering if it's possible. I know that it's it's extraordinary effort, but I don't think that the record will be open for this information tomorrow. So if it can't be provided now in some way by getting off and looking it up or something, um, then we either have to not close the hearing or we have to not get the information, it seems to me. Christian, I'm looking it up as we speak and I, um, of course, uh, won't delay any conversation, but I can let you know once I've found some information. That's the most helpful. Thank you. Okay. <clears throat> I'm going to just quickly go down the list of the board members and see if they have anything additional um, they would like to discuss at this point, or if there's any additional information they would like to request at this point. Um, Mr. Revelak. Uh, you're on mute. Right. Yes, uh, had to get my fingers on the right keys. Sorry about that. Uh, yes, I do have a few questions. Um, going back to the order of conditions, um, actually, most of the things that I had picked, uh, I'll, start at, I'll start at the back. Just a, this, this is a, a minor, thing and I'm uh, so uh, I-26 or in the second draft it was I-26 the last number or it's I-22 now okay um, so the sentence if replacement is necessary such replacements shall be subject to the approval of the commission I'm assuming that's conservation commission yes um, I might suggest saying Conservation Commission just for uh, clarity. Um, now earlier, and I missed the, the, the number when we were going through, but uh, the requirement that a phone number and web portal be provided. Because um, I'm not aware of any other project where we've required, where an applicant constructing a multifamily dwelling um, has been required to provide a web portal for, um, you know, infract so that abutters could report infractions. I'd like to get it. I'm wondering if um, how the applicants feel about this particular requirement. Daniel. Well, I, I would assume this is um, you you could either have the phone number or you could look up the property and you would see a contact number and a phone number for the property manager, or there could be an online link to an email address or some other way to send a message. Who knows? It may be, you know, some other uh, link at that point, text, uh, mm -hmm. LinkedIn, you know, Twitter, who knows what it is, but there's some, you know, direct way to send a message. Uh, I think 
today, that would be email most likely. Yeah. I mean, the way it's worded, it sounds more of a web, like a web form kind of thing. And right. I'm, I'm wondering if we could, uh, if we could say provide an electronic number, number and a method for, you know, electronic submission for residents to report potential, you know, basically just to make sure that, in, yeah, I, I think email should be an option. Maybe a written submission that can be uh, electronically uh, transmitted or something like that. It's a good a good point because it is a little ambiguous. Mr. Chairman, Mr. Hanlon, Mr. Pat, um, one thing I wanted to I mean, this is this is one of those things which is designed to help smooth the relationship between the mm -hmm. butters and not ne literally butters necessarily, but the neighborhood and the community. Uh, we're going to have a public hearing in a short and a certain period of time. And it would probably be a useful thing for uh, us to return to this issue after having, after the public having mm -hmm. some input into what they think about that. They may not care or they might care, but whatever it is, Mm -hmm. I'm assuming that that there'll be an amicable discussion about the general issue and that the idea is to come up with something that is general enough not to be unduly constricting to the applicant, but effective enough that that it provides comfort to the neighborhood that that uh, their concerns can be will be uh, addressed in an appropriate way. Yeah, I, I, I think uh, Mr. Hanlon, Mr. Hanlon said it better than I did. I was I was trying to avoid being too prescriptive in the conditions, essentially. Okay. Uh, so I just have two more questions. Um, one happens to be on the screen under F6. Um, any parking on private ways is prohibited. What was this meant to refer to? I hope not the 20% of town roadways, which are private ways. <laughs> It was well. Then, then we should look at the how it's written. Um, okay. But the the intent is that parking that private ways are not for the general parking of the general public. They're mm -hmm. they are private property, and for the use of the the property owner. Okay. All right. Um. All right, I'll, 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 th I, I will, I will ponder that. And uh, my lastly, uh, regarding bicycles, will residents have the option of storing bicycles in their dwelling units? There would be nothing to prevent them from doing so. Okay, so if uh, if a, you know, if a, if a, uh, you know, a tenant had two bicycles and put one in the bike room and one in their bedroom, that would be, for example, okay. I don't see that as an issue. Daniel, Julia, you see that as an issue? Well, I, I would just say, you know, often what happens when people are moving their bikes in and out of elevators and through hallways is they do a lot of damage. So, you know, as a kind of a management tool, you try to limit that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. um, so, um, but, you know what? You know what? Our thought on that was we want to provide other places, uh, um, if we can, to, to have people put bikes that might not have necessarily met the the town regulation. Whether that be a spot that you can hang a bike or park a bike at bike at an end of a end of a parking space or something like that. Now we haven't we haven't worked through all of that yet, but. Um, you know, maybe maybe the right way to do it is if somebody pay, takes their bike up into their room that they have to have a modest deposit for if there's damage or something. So um, we, we'd be happy to, mm -hmm. if that's something people really felt very strongly about, we'd be happy to, to consider that. Probably no worse than bringing Fido up the stairs with you, but. <laughs> All right, and... Uh... I believe that is all I had. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. Erlach. Mr. Chairman? Yes, please. Um, 
So I was looking at this section and had the same, some other questions the last time we met. I just didn't know whether to ask them at the time. <clears throat> Excuse me. So when I read that in F4B, have the on-site property manager address reported infractions and sort of dovetailing into Mr. Revelak's question about, well, how would that communication be made? What is it that a uh, resident? Roger, for some reason you are now on mute. I don't know what happened. I'm sorry, can you hear? Yep, now we can. Okay, so basically, what are the mechanics of this? Are there, are there going to be, is there going to be a list of the automobiles that residents own and the um, license plates so that if somebody can, uh, reports from Ryder Street and says, you know, somebody's been taking this right hand turn that they can identify who that is. So I'm just, I'm just wondering about the actual sort of nuts and bolts of how this is going to happen. Yes, the, um, Attorney DuPont, there's going to be a sticker and they're also going to have a hanger from the mirror. They're going to have assigned parking spaces. So um, uh, the license plate number will be um, affiliated with the specific parking space. So the property manager will have all that information. So the property manager could identify whose vehicle it is. But it's still being left up to the residents actually to keep an eye out and see when this is happening because there's no other sort of automated uh, monitoring like any sort of a camera or anything on the site that will uh, sort of be motion, uh, you know, sensitive to detect when somebody makes a right hand turn. No, and it would be difficult to monitor something like that on a regular basis in any event. Okay, so this is citizen uh, reporting essentially. Right. Okay. And whatever the property manager may see themselves, because they walk the property as well. Okay. All right. Thank you. No. Mr. Dupont, did you have any other questions or comments on the draft? Uh, no, not at this time. Okay, thank you. Uh, Mr. Hanlon, do you have further questions? No, I don't. Mr. Mills, do you have questions on the draft? I'm all set. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Ford, do you have any questions on the draft? No, thanks, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Um, and I think most of my questions were addressed. Um, most of the both of these comments were added um, at my request by by Mr. Haverty earlier. Um, are there any further questions uh, from uh, Beta in regards to the draft decision is over. I don't have any um, further questions or comments, Mr. Chair. I don't know if Laura Kraus or Bill McGrath does. Do I, I don't have any further comments. Okay. I, I don't have any either. Perfect. Thank you. Um, ask if uh, either. Uh, so from the town side, if Kelly Linema or Emily Sullivan or Jennifer Ray, have any further questions or comments in regards to the draft decision? I have just a minor question on the first page. Oh. Oh. This is just a clarification of the number of structures. Um, if you could go down believe it is, I think it's three or four. Mm -hmm. Oh, there it is, five. Um, so I had just looked up on the property card. There are three structures listed on the property card and here we say six. So just a clarification of, are these including any outbuildings that are being removed or um, uh, just some clarification about whether these are the buildings on the property card or if there are additional structures that are being considered. Uh, Joel, I'll defer to you on that. Or Randy. Mary, I, I know a little background on this and okay. so I'm 
willing to offer it. So I, I believe there is a, a difference um, in the, the number of buildings, quote unquote, listed in the historic materials uh, versus what's under on the property card. So um, it's, it's all the same number of buildings. I just think it's where you count one building versus two versus three. Um, so uh, there, there's definitely a higher count of buildings. And I think every addition that might have been added on to a building over time in the historic uh, register was uh, leads to a higher number of buildings um, on the site. But we, um, I think that we may be crossing those references. So that's, uh, but they're, because we're taking down some of the older buildings that are not deemed to be reusable, um, there's obviously more that exists today than there will be after we demolish some of those and save the others and, and, re, and rebuild the project. So should this say six existing structures or three? Well, I think it's accurate uh, to say the property does contain six now. And when we're done, it will have um, three. three. That was that was my only point of clarification. But otherwise, I don't have any other questions. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Mr. Chair. Yes, great. I, I do not have any other questions or comments at this time. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Hanlon. Um, <clears throat> at some point, I have a question relating to the letter regarding the poll that Ms. O'Connor submitted to us today. Um, that that isn't really a question on the draft and so i'm not quite sure when is the right time to raise that why don't you go ahead and let's go ahead and address that now okay on page two of the letter uh in the beginning i mean mr connor discusses two basic options one is an option of removal and relocation of the poll and the other has to do with varying things. Um, in the fifth paragraph, there's a general estimate of three hundred to five hundred thousand uh, uh, dollars for burying the service, which is claimed to make the project uneconomic. Um, in the first paragraph on that page, there's simply a, a statement that removing the pole uh, would uh, be very costly. Uh, and I was wondering whether uh, Ms. O'Connor could expand a little bit on what the word very costly gives. I, I understand that I'm not expecting anything down to the penny or even down to the dollar, but something that is roughly comparable to the statement that th it was made on the on varying, it would be useful so that as Mr. Revelak indicated before, we have just a general idea of what these costs sure. would be. Mr. Hanlon, you mean moving the pole over either to, uh, to the end of the side of the right of way or onto another property? Um, yeah, I think I think that's true. I, I'm not. I, I understood that first paragraph on page two to be referring to that. Yeah, that that could run anywhere between seventy-five to one hundred and fifty thousand dollars, depending on what's involved and what the utility company allows. One of the major issues is that, and I say in my letter, is that right now the, the lines that run across the Myrac Hyundai dealership are grandfathered. And um, the uh, utility company is loath to allow us to move the pole and continue to allow them, they don't allow that to let the uh, lines cross the live parking area. So that's what our utility consultant has been negotiating with them about. Okay. Now, my understanding from the letter is that in addition to that, there's no existing easement for those wires. And so that part of what would be necessary is right. to require that easement. Is that included in the cost that no, you No, uh, that would be extra, uh, but that's the cost of moving the pole and, and the resulting work. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Running down my list again, um, um, Ms. Sullivan. I wasn't sure if you had any further questions or comments. 
I just need a, a few more minutes for the bond and then I'm sure I'll have something for you. But other than that, um, no. Okay. Thank you. Perfect, thank you. Mr. Chairman, if we're unable to tie down a figure for the bond, we could always draft a condition that states that a bond for the, the work along Ryder Brook shall be provided in amount to be determined in consultation with the Conservation Commission. Ah, okay. Yeah, that might be a very good way to go. Mr. Chairman, just to say, I think that, I mean, I think that even when we get the costs, that we should use language that is basically like that, since we don't really know exactly what the costs would be. I think the main point for that Mr. Revelak was making was a desire to, for us to know about what those costs mm -hmm. were, and it was on an order of magnitude basis, but I didn't understand that as a basis for actually putting into the condition. Mm -hmm. And uh, Steve Revelock, Mr. Chair, I yeah. also presume that the applicants would be interested in knowing the, the amount as well. Absolutely. Uh, Christian, so I, um, oh, the, sorry, Mary. I, I'm sorry. I will say that my experience over the years with the Conservation Commission is that they are re fairly reasonable about that stuff. And um, Paul, to your point, I, I think the only um, consideration for the bond requirement would be for the relocated Ryder Brook. So um, in the past we've done, uh, the commission has required an escrow, um, but just to ensure that uh, the planting survive in a, in a project that, that has been uh, permitted by the, the commission. So I would imagine it would be a similar arrangement um, in that case, in that project, it was for the hotel down on Mass Ave. It was a six thousand dollar escrow so i imagine it would be somewhere in the line of that though that was uh year of, you know that's not uh exactly current with today's pricings but uh, i would imagine mary would be somewhat in that magnitude mm -hmm. thanks emily mm -hmm. thank you very much Ms. O'Connor, are there questions or further clarifications on the decision that you'd like to cover? No, I think the only substantive change that is going to require some um, comment from my client is the additional language concerning the poll and the use of Quinn Road. Mm -hmm. I think the other things are fairly, that are, are acceptable. Okay. Did you have a sense from speaking with the utilities that if you could move forward and move the poll, what the time scale for something like that would be? No. Okay. We did not get any sense. They move at their own pace. They do it that. Okay. Well, if there's any further questions from the board, I was going to go ahead and request public comment at this time. On a moment, I'll open the public comment period on the draft decision for the proposed project. Public questions and comments will be taken as they relate to the matters at hand, which will be directed to the board for the purpose of informing our decision. To provide for an orderly flow to the meeting and to allow the inclusion of many voices, the chair asks individual speakers to limit their comments. Additional time will be provided at the discretion of the chair to provide time for questions to be fully addressed. Procedure for requesting to speak will be the same as for prior hearings. Please select the raise hand button from the comments tab on Zoom or dial star nine on your phone to indicate you'd like to speak. When called upon, please identify yourself by name and address. You'll be given time for your questions and comments. All questions are to be addressed through the chair. Please remember to speak clearly and in a way that helps us to generate accurate record. 
once all public questions and comments have been addressed or the time allocated by the chair has ended, the public comment period will be closed for the session of the hearing. Board and the staff will do our best to show the section of the draft decision being discussed at the time. Um, so I will go ahead. Um, stop share so I can see who has their hands raised. Uh, first person is Mr. T. Uh, good evening. This is Alex T of Two Rider Street. Uh, I guess I, I would like to start by thanking uh, whoever is drafting these by uh, by taking a stab at addressing the parking. Um, you know, I think we as a as a community over here have felt have felt that's just a really overlooked uh, flashpoint for friction moving forward. And so I think the inclusion of the the web based and the the quarterly review language uh, is is very well intended. Uh, I know there were some questions about the web-based. I, I think at least personally, I'm highly in favor of, of broadening that language in terms of the ways in which that can be captured. I think electronic is good. The, the intention of that from our standpoint is twofold. One is to make it easy. Uh, again, phone calls are not always easy and, and it creates a closed loop where there's a, a, bit, a bit of traceability to it. Uh, and then the second part of that that the language doesn't reflect yet is just the, the transparency. Um, Again, we don't want data to be going into a black hole and then not to promote conversation. And I think that's gonna be really important uh, for making the quarterly review process uh, a fruitful one. Uh, again, I think this is all with the intention of, of creating a stronger working relationship between the two parties here. Um, and I think right now we're just feeling that there's still a real lack of attention and detail to the operational plan, right? You know, I think, uh, you know, it was referenced earlier on that, you know, all vehicles will be registered. Well, those are registered vehicles. What happens with unregistered vehicles from residents or visitors? Um, you know, I think we've, we haven't ever talked about what is the threshold for the amount of burden that our uh, street is willing to accept? And, and then what are the consequences of that? Um, again, you know, I, I think it's just it without that level of detail and without that level of foresight, we're just going to end up in a, in a very uncomfortable place from both sides. Uh, and just it's our intention that if we're asking for a waiver, now is the time to really think through those details. And, and we've requested that at three or four different points so far. So I think it's just uh, I really appreciate you taking the time to include that because it, it means we're not being ignored. But at the same time, I think we still have a, a lot of work to do to really address that the operational plan. Uh, I think we are also still really uncomfortable with that, that uh, you know, uh, eviction language uh, in it. Again, the, this, the, the equity of that in today's time and age was still uh, just felt uh, socially irresponsible. Um, and I'm kind of curious if this uh, monitoring will also uh, extend into the construction portion of the project as well. Uh, as you know, we, we witness a lot of uh, construction workers parking on our site each and every day, right? So again, I think that that's going to start sooner than later, and I'd rather, I would like to encourage the board to consider uh, suggesting language that that broadens that starts at the time of construction. Um, but for us, it's just really the we don't we don't have any we don't have a plan, right? And without a plan, we can't figure out how we're going to manage it together. Uh, and I think that's really what we're looking for. Thank you. Thank you. Um... I do just want to follow up with you briefly. Um, so when, you, when you're talking about the the operational plan and about unre unregistered vehicles and guests, are you concerned about the the number of vehicles that might be using Rider Street, or are you concerned about the the ability to report vehicles that aren't in their system, or is it a combination of the two? I I would say both are are real considerations. You know, I, I think that the uh, you know. Um, it's, I think it's just tough to enforce parking on a private way, right? So there's going to be, we, when, when there are a lot of vehicles here, um, there aren't a lot of plan Bs uh, for the residents. You know, we just kind of drive around. And again, that, that's, I think it's not as much of a problem right now because the type of traffic is asynchronous uh, where you have residents and commercial and we, one, one group kind of clears out to allow space for the other. This will actually almost kind of compound the issue now that we're going to have residential and residential and we're going to be, uh, trying to use the same spots at the same time. Mm -hmm. um, and then, yeah, it's just, how do we report, right? There's a car that's parked there. They walk towards the building. But again, we just haven't really talked through. Uh, that might be a resident, right? I mean, they have to pay for a spot and they, maybe they choose not to pay for a spot, right? So I think that's, again, there's, I think there's a lot of good intention in the current language, but there's so many details that haven't been thought through yet. 
Thank you. Uh, next, Mr. Anessi. Can you hear me? We can. Okay. Good evening, all. Uh, I heard the uh, comment about the fact that the utility companies work at their own pace. Uh, uh, I, I remind the members of the board that I contacted uh, Verizon in New York uh, and the applicant had applied uh, for uh, uh, plans to uh, move that pole uh, way back in January. Uh, and uh, what happened was uh, the applic uh, applicant was told to come up with a design and present that. <clears throat> that never happened. The design uh, was never in fact produced. So therefore, uh, the file at Verizon in New York was closed out. So to hear now that the utilities work at their own pace, uh, I think uh, is really not a fair uh, to, to me uh, as an abutter. <clears throat> I had a conversation today with uh, Ed Myrak. Ed Myrak called me. Ed Myrak is the uh, abutter on the other side. And Ed called me and inquired as to what the history was in terms of what was going on. He wanted me to tell him what in fact was going on, which I did. <clears throat> I explained to him that I'd met with the applicant, that I'd met with uh, counsel for the applicant at my office on July 19 of 2020. Uh, and at that time, I was told for the first time that they were planning on their project, developing their project. I uh, immediately registered an objection uh, indicating that I thought that the increased traffic would overwhelm the right of way and would overburden the right of way. I was told at that meeting not to worry because the pole was going to be removed from the right of way. Now, based upon that comment, uh, you may recall, I did not participate in a lot of the Zoom hearings. I did not participate because I was operating on the basis that the poll was going to be removed. I now know and I learned maybe 60 to 70 days ago that the poll is not going to be removed. Uh, I have explained to the board, I've given the board photographs, uh, I've explained to the board my concerns uh, about the safety issue. I think the board agrees with that. Uh, there's been discussion also about what the cost of an easement would be. Well, I represent a good portion of whatever that cost of an easement would be since my property abuts a goodly portion of the right of way. And I can tell you right now, Mr. Hanlon, that I would never charge anyone for an easement. And the cost to create an easement and record an easement, I would suggest to you, is not great. Uh, it can be done uh, uh, fairly economically. Now, I'm also told that the cost to move the pole, uh, whether it be off site uh, or whether it be uh, uh, whatever, okay, would be seventy five dollars to $100,000. I would suggest to the members of the board that seventy-five dollars to $100,000 to expend for a project like this, where the return for the developer is going to be so significant is not significant money. And it's the kind of money that should in fact be expended to ensure that there's going to be a safe uh, uh, traverse of traffic over the right of way. Uh, I again point out to the board that I've been, given, I've been given very short shrift by the Transportation Commission, by the town engineer, who basically never even came out here and looked at the right of way 
to see that there was a pole here, okay? They were talking about a bicycle path. One of them was talking about a bike path in that right of way uh, because they didn't even know there was a pole in the right of way. I'm asking for fairness. I've explained before, I'm not the Myrak family. I do have an investment in this property. I want, I'm going to protect that investment. Uh, I looked at the language uh, that was uh, it's being proposed. If you can conjure that, that up on your screen again, uh, uh, Christian, with respect to uh, the proposed language as far as the poll is concerned, it talks about the fact that the uh, site would be monitored, uh, traffic would not be allowed to either come down the right of way uh, while construction activities were going on. Well, again, I told you last time, I'm not going to wait for that, okay? I cannot afford to wait for that. If in fact a decision is written by the members of the Zoning Board of Appeal, it's filed in the town clerk's office, I will be at the courthouse forthwith filing an appeal within the 20 day appeal period. I am not going to leave my destiny and my future up to something that's undecided. Thank you. Thank you. I just wanted to quickly clarify, you had mentioned um, Ed Myrak. I wanted to confirm that was the Hyundai property, is that correct? That's the Hyundai property. Now he did say to me, by the way, that he was asked whether <clears throat> in fact uh, the pole could be moved onto his property. He said, Bob, I'm just finding out about this. I would need to look at liability issues. I would need to look at a lot of issues, which I haven't done. So he was very honest with me about that. So again, that goes to the issue of just how quick the applicant has been to move on this in terms of dealing with the poll issue. I think the poll issue has been on the back burner as I, I used an expression last time. It's time for the applicant to pull the trigger. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any further questions or comments from the public? I do not see any others. Going once, going twice. If we do close the hearing this evening, this will be the, the last opportunity to speak. So I'll leave this open Mr. for Chair, another I may. Mr. Maradianos. Hey, how are you tonight? Well, thank you. How are you? Very good, thank you. Um, have your uh, address for the record, please. Uh, yep, 17 Beck Road. Thank you. Um, earlier in the discussion, I heard um, talk about that the applicants now decided to want to put some form of identifying markers, I heard. Something about sticker or hanging tag or the combo. I believe they, they referenced that in regards to uh, vehicles that would be registered on their property. Okay, so that okay, so that's only okay. And um, did they say have any idea or anything of um, the location or the color, size, or anything of that nature yet? No. Okay. Um, well, you know, that's just pretty much it. And it was just uh, something I heard earlier that I just wanted to hear up on because uh, it's nice to hear though that uh, you know they're uh, you know listening to our concerns. Thank you. Anything further? Hi, um, uh, this is Narin Deshpande. Sorry, did I cut you, Peter? One, one second, I just oh. wanted to make sure Mr. Meridianos is done. Yep, nope, okay. I'm all set. Narin, go right ahead. Thank you. And uh, name and address of the record, please, sir. Uh, Narin Deshpande, uh, 18 Rydal Street. Thank you. So, sorry, I, uh, I joined late in the presentation, but I uh, when I joined, I heard about the reduction in parking spaces because of the uh, proximity to the bike path. Just out of curiosity, does the, um, do the amount of parking spaces correlate to the number of families? Or how, you know, for example, there are 80 apartments, are there 80 parking spaces at a minimum? Um, <coughs> excuse me. So the, I'm, I could ask Ms. O'Connor if they have, if they've, Followed a specific ratio that they were trying to hit. Oh, you're on mute. Sorry, Mary. 
um, the number of parking spaces is determined under the bylaw by bedrooms. Mm -hmm. um, and um, that's how we determine the maximum required. And uh, we gave you the number inside and outside. Okay. So is it one spot per bedroom? No, so, it's no. no. So currently there's uh, 124 proposed units. There's 128 proposed parking spaces. Okay. Uh, okay, thank you. Oh, That's you're welcome. Okay, thank you. There's anyone further you can under uh, participants or is it under, under reactions now? I keep moving. I guess it's under reactions. You can click on raise hand. Um, or if you're by phone, you can dial star nine. I don't think we have any participants currently on. We have one participant on phone. Hmm. Going once, going twice. If I could respond, Chairman Klein. Just, uh, uh, please go ahead. Um, with respect to Attorney Anessi's comments, I don't necessarily know who he spoke to in New York, but Bowler Engineering had been dealing with utility companies concerning that poll in the right of way for a significant period of time, as I said in my letter to the board. My client hired a specific consultant uh, when Bowler couldn't get uh, to the point that they needed them to get to to deal with the utilities. And you heard Mr. Nyhan a couple of hearings ago tell you what he had been doing. Um, if I just want to understand if, if my client can convince the utility company to allow it to move the pole to the edge of the right of way, is attorney Anessi satisfied with that? That gives Mr. me Anessi, 18, you, 18 in, uh, feet. Anessi, can you respond? Would you be willing to respond to that? Can you hear me, Mr. Klein? I can, sir. Okay. I'm going to reserve judgment. Uh, I have not been dealt with fairly from day one, okay, uh, in terms of having been led down the primrose path with respect to the pole being removed from the right of way. I'm going to reserve judgment out until I see a plan. And quite frankly, uh, if I see a plan that shows the pole, uh, eight feet away from my curb. I want to look at that carefully. I want to see where it's going to be. I want to see where it's going to be in, in, in relation to the driveway entrance to my parking lot. I'm not going to concede anything at this point, given the history of this transaction. Thank you. Chairman Klein, I just want to be very clear for the record. Please. Um, we, I participated in three meetings with Attorney Anessi. At none of those meetings uh, was it ever said that the poll would be removed. Um, I don't know if he heard it somewhere else, but it was not at any meeting I participated at um, uh, with him. And we brought to the meeting, his concern was traffic and the use of the right of way. And we gave him all the traffic data. We met with him three times. So I've known Bob for a very long time. I wouldn't deceive him or anyone else. So I'd like to say that for the record. May I say something, Mr. Klein? One last comment, Mr. Anessi. One last time. The person who told me, and I didn't want to say this, Mary, okay? The person who told me the poll was going to be moved was Bob Myrak, okay? I mentioned that to Bob, okay? Uh, and Bob said, well, it might be a question of aging that I might have forgotten, okay? When I mentioned that to him, okay? But that's all I'm going to say about that. <laughs> All right, I'd like to I think sort of tone this back down a little bit. Um, but I think we, we understand sort of the, the, the passion involved in this poll. Um, and I think the, I think the board is well aware of the requirements not only of the, the abutters but also the of the applicants. Uh, and this is definitely something that the board is going to need to discuss further um, in terms of how this is addressed. Um, in, a, in the written decision. Um, Chairman Klein, the only other thing I want, would like think we need to clarify 
is the quarterly review of the parking. I think what you were referencing was um, reviewing it uh, between uh, spots between guest parking and resident parking. I, I wanna make sure that's clear in the decision. Okay. Right, so we wanna make sure that the, the management company is reviewing that the allocation, the allocation. spaces between the different uses on the, because there's the three uses on the site between the guests, the, the work bar and the, um, and the residences. We wanna make sure that those spaces are being allocated properly so that everything is being captured and that there's not a deficit in any one of those that would cause an undue pressure on the adjacent community. Yes. Absolutely. Um, with that, I'm going to go ahead and close the public comment period for this evening. Okay. So next steps for the board. Um, Mr. Um, this, I if, uh, if I may, I just would like to briefly say a few words about parking, Mr. Chair. Okay. Now, I, I understand that the issue of parking is a, you know, it's a, it's a concern for, uh, for the abutters. Um, it's, you know, I, I recognize that it's, you know, a sort of unease and anxiety and, you know, Ryder Street is a, is a bit of a tricky street, but there are a couple of other things I'd also, I also just want to say for the record, um, you know, once upon back in the 70s, our town made some decisions regarding transit. And as a result of the way that came out, uh, we are probably a little more car dependent than we might have been had we made different decisions back then. And, you know, that kind of is what it is. But one, you know, in in terms of the conditions for this project, uh, there are turning conditions. There are, uh, you know, as in resident. Uh, residents of the apartment will not be able to make a right-hand turn on Ryder Street when leaving. Uh, there are also conditions preventing them from, um, from parking on Ryder Street. And, you know, we also have an enforcement mechanism, which is to say that, you know, the residents of this building are going to have a set of restrictions that are unique to them. Um, you know, they will which is to say, I could drive down, if I had a car, I could drive down Ryder Street and make a left onto Beck Road, but a person living in this building couldn't. And, you know, I understand the, you know, the, the, um, you know, the feelings of the um, abutters, but I'm also, you know, I have some reservations about, you know, basically placing restrict, having an affordable housing development where there are specific restrictions that are unique to that development. And finally, I also would want to note that one substantial contingent, um, you know, who's going to be affected by the outcome of this project are the residents who live in this building. And given the nature of these proceedings, they are not represented. represented. And, you know, given the, you know, how long apartment buildings last for, they're most, I bet you there's a lot of them that haven't even been born yet. So I, I and I'm, you know, I just want to just to say, I, un, you know, I want, um, you know, basically, bef I realize that, you know, basically, we're putting restrictions on this property in perpetuity that will be relatively unique to it. And I, you know, I'm not going to oppose it. But I, I just, I do, at the same time, I do not have a good feeling about it, or I don't have a great feeling about it. Anyway, thank you, Mr. Chair. I just wanted to, um, wanted to get that off my chest. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Chairman. Mr. Hanlon. Um, you know, I, 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 I do want to stress that the draft decision we have before us is a draft decision, and we have lots of things that we have to consider. And I think that the points that Mr. Revelak just made are things that we, uh, that we need to consider. That ultimately our obligation is to all the residents and and the people who move in here will be Arlington residents as well. Um, 
but to pass on from that, I, I, I just want to send a, to try to be, to try to provide a little transparency on at least how this member of the board feels about the poll. Um, and I don't really want to be involved in the increased emotions that have happened as, as, as a result of whatever understandings or misunderstandings that have taken place between the applicant and, and Mr. Anessi. Um, those are, are matters that are very important to the parties, but they're not really important to our decision. What is important to our decision is the fact that we have a poll right in the middle of a, right in the middle of a road. And regardless of the effect that has on Mr. Vanessi's property, and I'm not indifferent different to that, it's just not good public policy to do that. Uh, and it's clear that some moving of that poll is really an important thing to do. Uh, whether that can be accomplished by moving it onto the car dealership's property or whether it has to just go over to the very edge of the right of way, um, I'm not quite sure. But I'm, I'm not 100% comfortable with the language we have. And uh, I understand that there's at least arguably that, that doing something more aggressive may make this uneconomic. We unfortunately are not going to have the information at our disposal to be able to know for sure uh, whether it will or not. But when it comes to de deliberating on this and making a final decision as to what the language is here, uh, I think one of the things we're going to have to discuss is whether we need to be uh, more uh, aggressive on, on this. I'm, I'm hoping that the discussions that will ensue uh, and that are probably going on right now will actually lead to a resolution that will make everything work out all right in the end. Uh, but I would like to encourage the applicant and everyone else not to regard the draft decision as necessarily dispositive on that issue. There's discussion that I think we need to have uh, before we decide what the best solution is. Thank you, Mr. Hanley. Uh, Mr. So I think at, at this juncture, I think the important question for the board is, do we have all the information we need to render, to discuss and render a decision on this project? Or is there any other outstanding information that this board needs in order to deliberate and come to a conclusion? I'll just quickly go down the list of board members. Uh, Mr. DuPont. Uh, Mr. Chairman, can you hear me? I can. Um, so I, I do wonder, you know, I don't have any specific issues that I need to have more information on, um, but I do think that, and you probably have already asked this question, um, as long as, you know, Ms. Linema and Ms. Sullivan and uh, Ms. Krauss and Nover and all of the people who are involved on our side of things feel that they have the information that they've needed to make recommendations to us. I feel confident at that point that we're okay. I just don't know that we know that for certainty. So perhaps they should be canvassed again to make sure that there's nothing outstanding that they see. Thank you for that. Um, I will come back to that. Uh, Mr. Hanlon? Mr. Chairman, I, I agree with what Mr. DuPont just said. I, I don't think it's ever perfect. And we can have, we, we can keep going on this hearing for a long time. And we'll, every time we have a hearing, we will discover something else that we wish we knew. Um, at some point it has to come to an end. And I think that, uh, that the way in which Mr. DuPont suggests is is a good way of, of, of thinking about it. Thank you. Mr. Mills? Um, I think Mr. Uh, Turney Anisi brought up an interesting point today that Mr. Myrak may be amenable to negotiations. I hate to forestall these proceedings, but I do believe... Oh, we lost your audio. Kevin, I'm sorry, we lost your audio, I think. Uh, 
all I get to say. Well, Kevin, I apologize. We lost everything up until you said that's all I have to say. <laughs> I apologize. I'm down in Plymouth, and sometimes our signal's a little weak. That's okay. Uh, what I was saying is Mr. Anishi, Attorney Anishi, has brought up a very, uh, what I think is important, salient point, that Mr. Myrak may be amenable to moving the pole onto his property, which alleviates a you know, major constriction on that roadway. Uh, I hate to continue these proceedings any longer than necessary, but it could you know, short circuit his possible lawsuits, which would be extending the whole project. Uh, is there any way we can assert whether Mr. Myrak would be amenable to this situation? Well, certainly. Uh, so, so that would be Mr. Ed Myrak, um, who is not uh, who is not on the call, and I don't believe any represent anyone representing him is on the call at this time. He, he is not at that point yet. Okay. Is there anybody who can initiate a discussion with him to see if he is amenable and report back to the board, see in a short amount of time? We have initiated discussions with him um, and he's going to get back to us and it's a continuing dialogue. Thank you, Mary. Okay, thank you, Mr. Mills. Anything further, Mr. Mills? No, I'm all set. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Ford? No, I, I think I'm uh, in agreement with Mr. DuPont and Mr. Handling about the approach. I think I have everything I need as long as, as our um, consultants do. Perfect. Thank you. And Mr. Revelak. Uh, Mr. Chair, I concur with Mr. DuPont, Hanlon, and Ford. Fantastic. Thank you all. Then with that, I will really reach out. Um, Start with Ms. Krauss, if there's anything you you feel that you might have need additional information on in order to properly inform the board. Uh, from an environmental standpoint, and I, I Bill uh, McGrath had uh, he's no longer on the call, but from a civil site design standpoint, um, you know we we had enough information to provide the board with comments related to the design and whether uh, typical. Um, uh, engineering practices, as well as, you know, environmental health and, um, and conditions that, that would uh, be required to protect the environment. So I think we're, we're all set. Perfect. Thank you. Um, Marty Nover, did you have anything further? Mr. Chair, no, I, I don't have anything further. Um, I didn't follow the whole process as closely as Laura Krause, but I do know that um, the applicant did address um, our comments from, from the initial review, you know, revised the plan, added some mitigation measures um, relative to, to Ryder Brook um, plantings, you know, any, any um, environmental regulatory issue that we um, rose or had comments on, they, they addressed um, to our satisfaction. Mm -hmm. And um, the Conservation Commission and Beta worked on the draft um, conditions um, together, um, you know, with the Conservation Commission ultimately um, agreeing to um, the draft conditions. So at this point, we don't have anything further. Do you know if there's anything in regards to um, to the traffic side? I, I believe that they sort of wrapped everything up much earlier. Yeah, maybe Laura can respond. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So um, yes, that, that's correct. Uh, at the uh, out at the end of the, the traffic review, all of the comments had been addressed and some uh, traffic related conditions were recommended. Yep, but other than that, uh, the, the review was complete and, and all of the comments had been addressed. Perfect, thank you very much. Um, Emily Sullivan, are there, is there anything further from the Conservation Commission side? I, I know that um, their chair is unavailable to be here this evening? Um, no, the, the commission uh, feels like every, uh, all comments were addressed. They reviewed everything thoroughly and the commission um, 
wants to reiterate again, uh, it's appreciation that the applicant was so responsive to additional information requests and then uh, to uh, some uh, recommendations for minor changes. So uh, thank you. Thank you. Um, and then uh, Kelly Linema, is there anything else from the planning department's perspective? No, um, in, nor have I heard from any other departments to whom I've reached out about any other outstanding issues. I feel like the applicant has been responsive to everything that's been addressed, including from the Transportation Advisory Committee. Perfect, thank you. So Mr. Haverty, with all that in mind, sounds like the board has what it needs to render its decision. So believe that it does, Mr. Chairman, at least to enter into its deliberation process. So technical, what is the technical way for us to do that? You just vote to close the public hearing and then you have to set a date for a public deliberation session. Okay. Perfect. So may I have a motion to that effect? Mr. Chairman. Mr. Hanlon. Uh, I move that the board uh, close the public hearing on this case. I'm, I'm assuming there'll that? be a second motion after that to schedule. Absolutely. A deliberation. Do I have a second on that motion? Second. Thank you, Mr. Mills. Um, Mr. Haverty, would that, would should this vote be limited to the, the five voting members or can it still be the full vote of the board? I mean, it, anyone that's on the board can vote. Ultimately, it's the, the whoever are the, the five voting members whose votes will actually count. Okay. With that in mind, then I'll do a roll call vote of the board. Mr. DuPont? Aye. Mr. Hanlon? Aye. Mr. Mills? Aye. Mr. Revlack? Aye. Mr. Ford? Aye. And the chair votes aye. So the public hearing period for comprehensive permit for 1165 Armaster Avenue is now closed. Um, the board now needs to schedule its deliberations to discuss the draft decision. Um, Right. Next week um, on Tuesday, we have a continuation of um, Thorndike Place. And then regrettably, I'm away. Um, but I wanted to propose to the board that we meet um, again online on Tuesday, August 24th. That's a date that is available. I, I think we're already meeting that day, right? Yeah, so I think that that's, I had, I had set this date, I put this date on the calendar for this purpose, so I just wanted to Got it. confirm. Thank you, Jim. And that um, if we were not, if we were unable to complete our deliberations on the 24th, that we could then extend to um, Thursday, September 2nd, that date is available to everyone. Perfect. Um, so by statute, we have 40 days uh, from this date. So that 40 day date is uh, currently Saturday, September 4th. Um, so hopefully we can um, close things uh, by, the, by September 2nd. Um, and be closed and complete. Um, but if the board is still in deliberations, uh, we'll have to reach out to the applicant and request a, an extension for, for deliberations. But I'm hopeful at this stage that we will, that will not be required. So with that in mind, can I have a motion to, I guess it can, at this point, right. are we continuing or are just, we beginning discussions? You just need a motion to adjourn, Mr. Chairman. You, you vote. Oh, okay. 
you've already moved to continue. You've set your date for the deliberation, so you're ready to adjourn. No, okay. We haven't we haven't voted on those dates, so I just want to make. Oh, okay. We should probably vote on them. So then, so may I have a a motion to uh, continue until Tuesday, August twenty fourth at seven thirty p.m. Um, like I said, that's what we would be looking for. Mr. Chairman. Mr. Hanlon. Just state that a little bit differently because it's not continuing the hearing. I, I move that right. we commence the de deliberation stage of the case uh, on uh, August the 24th, uh, beginning at 7.30. And I, I think that although we have in our minds that we'll do it again if we need to on the second, it would probably be more orderly to make that motion on the 24th. In agreement. Uh, may I have a second on that? Second. Thank you, Mr. Mills. A, a vote of the board. Uh, Mr. DuPont? Aye. Thank you. Mr. Hanlon? Aye. Mr. Mills? Aye. Mr. Revelak? Aye. Mr. Ford? Aye. And chair votes aye. So we will be begin our public deliberations on August 24th at 7.30 p.m. Thank you. Mr. Chairman? Yes, please. Before we, we go, and, and it's still only 9.22, uh, but I, I think that at this point, it's, it's worth it for us to thank both the applicant for being cooperative, but I wanted to focus particularly on the extraordinary degree of cooperation and coordination that Beta has done with town staff and how responsive they've been. We saw it just tonight with Emily leaving the meeting and, and going to dig up information that we needed before it all began. I, I think that the process that we've had here has been exemplary and that both town staff and Beta deserve a great deal of thanks from the commission for the efficient and effective way that they've participated in this process. Absolutely. Yes, thank you very much, all of you. No, it's a greater appreciation to, to all of you. I know it's been a, a very strange way to conduct a, a series of hearings. Um, there are so many of you who I, I, you know, we all know very well online who we have never actually met in person, <laughs> um, which, <laughs> which is very odd, but um, really appreciate the way everyone has has assisted this board um, and has really helped to, to craft uh, what, what hopefully will be a, a very positive uh, decision for the for the town, for the applicant, and and for the for the neighbors, and that we can you know address their concerns appropriately uh, in our final decision. Okay, so I will just want to bring up. Uh, Where did you go? Um, just bring up our calendar really quick, which we've been doing recently, just to make sure everyone's aware of what's coming up next. Uh, so today was a continuation of 1165R, so that's complete now. Um, and so we closed before the August 2nd deadline for closing the public hearing, so we're good there. Tuesday, August 3rd, we have a continuation of Thorndike Place schedule. Uh, Tuesday, August 24th at 7.30. Um, that is no longer proposed. It is now scheduled uh, with the possibility of extension on September 2nd. Uh, September 4th is the 40-day close on the deliberation period. And then um, on Thursday, September 9th is the further continuation of Thorndike Place. Um, September 14th, we have a hearing schedule for 2020 a Lafayette Street, and it was a new hearing, and then, but a regular hearing, not a comprehensive permit hearing. And Friday, September 17th is currently the, uh, the final clo possible close date for Thorndike Place without an extension. Just make sure everyone has those in their calendars. Everybody's all set with those. And then with that, I will take a motion to adjourn. So moved, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much, Mr. Hamlin. Second. 
Thank you, Mr. DuPont. Quick roll call vote. Mr. DuPont? Aye. Mr. Hanlon? Aye. Mr. Mills? Aye. Mr. Revelack? Aye. Mr. Ford? Aye. The chair votes aye. We are adjourned. Thank you all so very much for all your assistance uh, tonight and over the last year. It's been extremely helpful. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. Good night, Thanks. Good night. Good night. Good night everybody. Good night, everybody. Good night. Good night, everyone. Good night, everyone.